Very Welcome good. everyone. We have a, around 200 people registered to attend today, which is great. This is one of a series of webinars on our recently released Respect at Work report on the National Inquiry into Workplace Sexual Harassment in Australian Workplaces. Each webinar will be focused on a different stakeholder group. Today's focus on employment law and regulation is particularly important as we want to circle back to many of you who contributed to the inquiry through submissions and consultations, and who will also play a critical role in implementing the recommendations. Employment law and regulations is, are also key foundation stones of the new framework for addressing sexual harassment, which we proposed following the National Inquiry. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional lands of our First Nations people. I'm presenting from the lands of the Wurundjeri and the Boonarung people of the Kulin Nation. I encourage you to take a moment to pay your respects to the traditional owners in your location. Please be aware the session is being recorded and will be available to share with others. I'm mindful that people listening to this webinar might find the content confronting. And so if you need, I remind you of the support services that are available. You can call 1800 RESPECT or 000 if you're in immediate danger. Thank you for your questions posed ahead of time. And you can send through questions at any time using the Q&A function located either on the right of your screen or at the bottom. It looks like a text message symbol. The Q&A is pre-moderated, so there may be a short delay before your question appears publicly. Participants can also turn on live captioning if you require via your settings, which are indicated by three dots, either at the right or bottom of your screen, and then choose turn on live captions. Now to introductions. Many of you will know that I'm the Australian Sex Discrimination Commissioner. I started in this role in 2016 and have worked on a number of significant projects at the Australian Human Rights Commission, including working with universities, defence and play by the rules. And I'm delighted that today Bernadette O'Neill has, has agreed to join me as a presenter in this session. Bernadette has more than 25 years experience in workplace relations in both public and private sectors. And I'm also glad for her contribution to our inquiry up until now and again today. So Bernadette, can I hand over to you to introduce yourself to our audience? You're on mute, Bernadette. Yeah. yeah. Goodness me, I'll get there. Um, Thanks, Kate, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm really looking forward to the discussion over the next hour and a half, and um, uh, we've enjoyed kind of our role in um, watching and um, providing some information into the inquiry and uh, and the report. So, um, looking forward to being here. Thanks, Bernadette, and I'm looking forward to you speaking next. So I'll just give some opening remarks. Um, as a quick refresher to this crowd, although many of you will be fully across this, this is the definition of sexual harassment under the Sex Discrimination Act. At its simplest, sexual harassment is unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature, which reasonably causes the person harassed to be offended, humiliated or intimidated. And our national inquiry focused on sexual harassment at work. We commenced the national inquiry in 2018 with the support of government, unions and employers and off the back of the global Me Too movement, which played, placed a renewed spotlight on the prevalence of sexual harassment at work. The goal of the inquiry was to examine the nature, prevalence and drivers of sexual harassment in Australian workplaces and measures to address and prevent it. Our Respect at Work report is the culmination of 18 months of work involving a survey of 10,000 workers, 60 public consultations with 600 participants, 460 written submissions, global research and economic modelling. 
I launched Respect at Work alongside the Minister for Women, Senator the Honourable Maurice Payne, on Friday the 6th of March 2020. Minister Payne and the Attorney General, the Honourable Christian Porter, welcomed the report and said the Australian Government would carefully consider its recommendations. They also underlined the government's commitment to ensuring Australian workplaces are safe and free from sexual harassment. Many participants in the inquiry shared with me their devastating experiences of sexual harassment at work and the inadequate responses. Most heartbreaking was the long-term harm and financial hardship caused by the experience. We found that sexual harassment is a common experience. Our survey and inquiry told us that the workplace sexual harassment is pervasive. It includes, it, it occurs in every industry, in every location and at every level in Australian workplaces. In 2018, one in three Australian workers had experienced sexual harassment at work in the last five years, which was up from one in five in 2012. We found the current system places the onus on the victim to complain. And yet we found that only 17% of people who said they were sexually harassed at work did complain. We found that sexual harassment happens in all workplaces. Our 2018 survey collected for the first time industry specific data across 21 ABS defined industry sectors which provides a valuable resource for industry action. And we found sexual harassment has a high cost. Deloitte Access Economics modelled the economic cost of workplace sexual harassment for the inquiry. They estimated that workplace sexual harassment cost the Australian economy $3.8 billion in 2018. So overall, it became clear that the current system for addressing workplace sexual harassment in Australia is complex and confusing for victims and employers. Our inquiry revealed an urgent need to shift from the current reactive complaints based approach to one that requires positive action from employers and had a focus on prevention. Our Respect at Work report proposes a new approach which builds upon Australia's existing policies and initiatives through 55 recommendations which, which fall under five areas of focus. Data and research to deliver useful industry-based information about the nature of sexual harassment and effective responses. Primary prevention of sexual harassment through education, media and community-wide initiatives a refocused legal and regulatory framework, which recognises the mutually reinforcing roles of discrimination, workplace and safety laws. Better workplace prevention and responses, which are leader driven, practical and adaptable. And better support, advice and advocacy for people who experience sexual harassment. For today's webinar, I will focus on the work place prevention and response and the legal and regulatory framework recommendations in the Respect at Work report. So starting with the workplace. During the inquiry, there was widespread acknowledgement by employers, workers and their representative bodies that the current approach to prevent workplace sexual harassment was not working. We heard that employer methods had remained largely unchanged for decades and were failing to prevent or effectively respond to sexual harassment. It became clear through the inquiry that employers and particularly small business owners wanted greater guidance on what good practice looks like for addressing workplace sexual harassment. In response, the Commission recommended a new framework for workplaces to better prevent and respond to sexual harassment. The new framework provides a more holistic approach that looks beyond policies, training and complaint handling procedures. It's adaptable for businesses of all sizes and in all industries. The new framework has seven areas of focus, four to prevent sexual harassment and three to respond to sexual harassment. To better prevent sexual harassment, we need firstly strong leadership to create a safe working environment. 
Secondly, a greater focus on risk assessment, drawing on the commitment to transparency and a willingness to learn from past experience and a philosophy of continuous improvement within the workplace, which applies in many through a safety lens. Thirdly, policies which build an organisational culture of trust and respect. And lastly, we need to use workplace education and training to improve knowledge and develop a collective understanding of expected workplace behaviour and processes. But what happens when sexual harassment does occur? The framework recommends three areas in which employers can focus their response efforts. Firstly, providing support to workers throughout the reporting process and prioritising worker wellbeing. Secondly, increasing reporting options for workers and addressing barriers to reporting. It will be particularly important to create new ways for sexual harassment to be addressed other than launching a formal investigation, which is a route that very few victims go down. And lastly, measuring, which means collecting data at a workplace level and at an industry level, so that we can understand the prevalence, nature and impacts of workplace sexual harassment and evaluate the effectiveness of initiatives designed to address it. To embed this new framework within, Australian, within Australia, we made several specific recommendations focused on employers and industry. We recommended that the Australian Institute of Company Directors and Governance Institute of Australia develop education and training for board members and company officers. We also recommended that public sector organisations be required to report on their gender equality indicators to the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. And we recommended that the ASX Corporate Governance Council introduce sexual harassment indicators against which AS ASX listed com companies can report. And we made some industry specific recommendations, such as that industries use their licensing and accreditation schemes to hold members to account for sexual harassment, and that they develop industry specific prevalence surveys, codes of conduct, and awareness raising campaigns to apply across a single industry. As many of you will be aware, the three main legislative schemes that regulate sexual harassment in the workplace are the anti-discrimination laws, the fair work system, and work health and safety laws. Our inquiry concluded that the interaction between these three schemes is confusing and sometimes inconsistent for workers and employers. However, we found that there are significant benefits to each of these regimes which are well recognised across Australia. So our recommendations are designed to strengthen and clarify these frameworks so they can work in a complementary and mutually reinforcing manner. Firstly, we found that the Sex Discrimination Act or the SDA should continue to be the primary piece of legislation regulating sexual harassment at work and the anchor for consistency across the state and territory equal opportunity acts and the fair work and safety regimes. We identified a range of enhancements required to make the SDA and the Australian Human Rights Commission Act better suited to the contemporary experiences of work. These enhancements include clarifying that the SDA covers all people in the world of work, including those who are paid, unpaid and self-employed, and state public servants, expressly prohibiting sex-based harassment and prohibiting creating an intimidating, hostile, humiliating or offensive environment on the basis of sex, extending the Commission's discretion to decline complaints from six months to 24 months after the alleged unlawful discrimination took place, and consistent with other grounds of discrimination, allowing for representative complaints and extending liability to those who aid or permit another person to sexually harass a person, and empowering the Australian Human Rights Commission to inquire into systemic unlawful discrimination, including systemic sexual harassment. We've also recommended that a positive duty be introduced to the SDA. 
The positive duty requires all employers to take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate sex discrimination, sexual harassment and victimisation as far as possible and would be accompanied by functions for the Commission to assess compliance with the duty and enforcement. We observed during the inquiry that many large employers assumed that such a positive duty already exists as it does in Victoria. The Workplace Prevention and Response Framework, which I mentioned earlier, will be key to enabling employers to comply with this duty. And to improve our national approach to discrimination laws, we made a recommendation for state and territory governments to amend their anti-discrimination legislation with the objective of achieving consistency to at least the minimum standards of the SDA. We heard that the fair work that fair work is regarded as the central place for workplace grievances and a system that has a long and respected history in this country. While the Fair Work Act covers grounds of discrimination, currently it does not expressly prohibit sexual harassment. Workers with multiple workplace grievances told us they wanted a simpler system to raise workplace concerns in one place. Employers told us they got mixed signals from the Fair Work Commission when it came to sexual harassment misconduct, especially through the unfair dismissal jurisdiction. Bernadette will talk more about this, but our key recommendations for changes to the Fair Work system include expressly prohibiting sexual harassment under the Fair Work Act, using the definition in the SDA, introducing a stop sexual harassment order equivalent to the stop bullying order currently in the Act, clarifying that sexual harassment can be conduct amounting to valid reason for dismissal in determining whether a dismissal was harsh, unjust or unreasonable, and including sexual harassment in the definition of serious misconduct in the Fair Work regulations. Australian work health and safety laws already impose a duty on employers to prevent sexual harassment in the context of the broad duty to eliminate or manage hazards or risks to a worker's health, which includes psychological health and therefore sexual harassment. We heard through the inquiry that there's an urgent need to raise awareness that sexual harassment is a work health and safety issue. We therefore recommended changes to the model work health and safety regulation to deal with psychological health and development of guidelines in sex on sexual harassment, which could be used to inform the development of a code of practice on sexual harassment. After close consideration, we determined that non-disclosure agreements or NDAs play a valuable role in protecting the privacy and confidentiality of parties and provide, providing closure. However, I am concerned that blanket NDAs also undermine prevention of sexual harassment by impeding proper scrutiny by boards and governance bodies, by preventing organisations learning from complaints and identifying systemic issues, and by making it easier for perpetrators to reoffend with impunity within the same workplace and beyond. Therefore, we've recommended the Commission develop a guideline identifying best practice principles for the use of NDAs in workplace sexual harassment matters to inform the development of a regulation on NDAs. During the inquiry, we also heard that Australia's defamation laws discourage victims from making a complaint. In addition to their current review of defamation laws, we recommended that the Council of Attorney Generals consider how to protect alleged victims of sexual harassment who are witnesses in civil proceedings, including defamation proceedings. And recognising the numerous agencies, tribunals and courts that may address disputes involving sexual harassment, we also recommended that trauma-informed education on the nature, drivers and impacts of sexual harassment be a standard component of training for judges magistrates and tribunal members, as well as for fair work, safety and workers' comp regulators. Our world has changed dramatically since our report was tabled in Parliament on the 5th of March. 
The need to address sexual harassment hasn't lessened. However, the immediate priority for our governments and many workplaces has changed and rightly so. While the government's response to respect to work may now be delayed, I think you'll agree that employers and regulators already have in our comprehensive report the information they need to take action to create more productive, respectful and safe workplaces. Bernadette, I look forward now to hearing your reflections on the report and I do remind and encourage participants to continue to send questions for Bernadette and I to answer in her address. So over to you, Bernadette. Thanks, Kate. Can you hear me all right? Yes. All right, lovely. Um, hi, everyone. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm presenting from the lands of the Wurundjeri people and wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners uh, and to pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging. Um, I'd also like to really warmly congratulate Kate and the entire team who have conducted this inquiry into workplace sexual harassment and produced this comprehensive report, Respect at Work. Um, it's a significant contribution in, in every respect. Um, in addition to the many recommendations that will be considered by government and others, it provides a lot of insights and learnings and opportunities, I think, for the workplace relations community to consider. Um, for our part, the report contains a number of insights that we can use now in thinking about how we deliver our services uh, and in the context of disputes that, that we're currently um, charged with resolving. So over the next few minutes, I wanted to really just um, draw out and mention a few of these aspects of the report and then share some observations with you about the anti-bullying jurisdiction um, in light of the report's recommendation that there be a stop sexual harassment order. As Kate said, and certainly as the report lays bare, the current system for addressing workplace sexual harassment is complex and confusing for victims and employers to understand and to navigate. I, I doubt that there's a single person in the nation that would disagree. Um, and I, I think that many of us that are here today uh, in either our current or former lives have needed to get our own heads around the system uh, so that we can develop services or represent or advise employers or employees. And certainly speaking for myself, the, the difficulties that I've experienced over the years uh, doing that um, speaks volumes about how much harder it must be for individuals that aren't professionally trained in the dark arts of law workplace relations, human resources and related fields. Um, there's numerous agencies and organisations that have various roles to play under the current system. From the Fair Work Commission's perspective, um, as the National Workplace Relations Tribunal, there's quite an extensive intersection uh, in relation to workplace sexual harassment. Complaints involving this can come to the tribunal via a number of different pathways. Um, there are, of course, unfair dismissal cases, both in relation to dismissals of victims of sexual harassment, uh, but also of alleged perpetrators. A, a further pathway is the unlawful termination of employment cases uh, where dismissal is alleged to have occurred on the basis of sex. Um, then there's the general protections cases involving dismissal, but also involving other forms of adverse action and the relevant grounds that claims can presently be brought are either on the basis of sex um, or on the basis of the exercise, for example, of a workplace right uh, being the right to make a complaint to a uh, body in response to sexual harassment. It's also our experience that some anti-bullying claims uh, have involved claims of sexual harassment. And the other mechanism is disputes that are brought under dispute resolution mechanisms and enterprise agreements, um, both individual grievances, but also collective disputes is another mechanism. 
There's another way that's perhaps less well known, and that's the Commission's work in assisting parties to problem solve, um, upskill and negotiate new agreements. And I'm talking here about the interest-based training and facilitation work that the and services that the Commission provides. Um, call, it's called new approaches and new cooperative ways of working are facilitated uh, intensively with the assistance of members of the Commission. It's a relatively new area. Um, it's had some pretty remarkable successes to date, but interestingly, it's also led to requests for some quite comprehensive upskilling of uh, participants such as firms, HR, business parties in better understanding and equipping them to um, work in the space of anti-bullying and unfair dismissal jurisdiction, for example. Unfortunately, uh, I can't share with you any details about either the volume or the characteristics of any of the cases that come before the Fair Work Commission involving workplace sexual harassment, um, as we simply don't collect any of this data currently in a way that is vaguely useful. And this is one of the very strong points, I think, that Respect at Work makes out the need for effective systems uh, to collect and report consistent data on workplace sexual harassment. Um, there's no doubt that achieving that will throw up some challenges, but uh, the importance of good, robust, shared, de-identified data seems to me to be self-evidently true. From from the Fair Work Commission's perspective, uh, one of the other recommendations that seems eminently sensible to me, uh, at least, is the establishment of a Workplace Sexual Harassment Council, um, which would include the Fair Work Commission, Fair Work Ombudsman, Safe Work Australia, the heads of workplace uh, safety and workers' compensation authorities and others. Um, uh, the proposed council, or, or indeed a similar informal mechanism, um, can really play a role with cross-sector collaboration and help with improving coordination and consistency and clarity so that uh, you know the end objective is that the process for victims and employers is simply a simpler uh, and easier. From, from our perspective, um, these kind of forums can play a really valuable role. Have, having a forum creates a space where all the players in the system can take a step back and take a system wide approach, uh, which can lead to better information sharing, understanding and collaboration, partly simply through the relationship building that occurs uh, through these mechanisms. It's often challenging without prompts such as this, when you're busy dealing with a caseload that comes through the door, to remember to take a system wide approach to improving service delivery for victims and employers who need help and support. And whether it's referrals uh, to a more appropriate agency or indeed ensuring that our staff uh, really comprehensively understand the role of other agencies and bodies when they're responding to queries from the public. Um, collaboration and, co and cooperation is essentially grounded in relationships. And so I think that building better relationships can only help um, both at that high level, but also broader relationships at the operational level. And in a similar vein, the, the role of the council is proposed to extend to high level advice on developing guidelines and resources, um, coupled with a further recommendation that employers, employer associations and unions adopt a collaborative approach to deliver information, education and resources. Um, as the report notes, there's a vast amount of resources already in existence. Uh, the question and the challenge is, are they as effective as they could be? Um, I think there's uh, many opportunities to improve the current offerings. Uh, I'm not sure that the world needs another set of fact sheets. I think there's opportunities around some of the digital tools that are available, um, online platforms and the like to develop resources using user-centered design, working through user experience uh, that could be more useful to the community. And that's something that's very important to the Fair Work Commission, um, particularly given 
the fundamentally different profile of people who now interact with us. Uh, from participants who are familiar with the legislative scheme and our processes, uh, we now have a far greater proportion of one-shotters. Um, people where their case is likely to be the first and only direct inter interaction they have with the tribunal. Uh, and they come often in a heightened emotional state and um, often distressed, whether an applicant employee uh, or, or an employer. So we're certainly increasingly using these approaches to review and improve all of our information resources. Um, but at the same time, providing resources that also meet the needs of more frequent users, um, such as the Commission's bench books on different areas that some of you may have, uh, have come across and hopefully found useful. Um, Kate mentioned the, that the, uh, the issue of the non-disclosure agreements and uh, the proposed council is also, as I understand it, envisaged to have a role in the development of um, a practice note or guideline that identifies best practice guidelines around the use of non-disclosure agreements. Uh, the inquiry shone a light on some of the issues and challenges relating to confidential settlements and workplace sexual harassment matters. And the development of principles in the space could be informative, including for the Fair Work Commission, uh, where we facilitate many thousand settlements each year. So uh, turning to the proposed recommendation that there be a stop sexual harassment order, somewhat analogous to the existing anti-bullying jurisdiction that the Commission exercises. Um, in addition to our experience that some anti-bullying claims have included allegations of sexual harassment, um, there's other possible similarities that might provide some clues into how such a jurisdiction may work if this recommendation were to be adopted by government. I'm thinking, for example, of the incidents uh, of this behaviour in the community with the 2018 survey referenced in Respect at Work. I think finding that one third of people who'd been in the workplace in the last five years said that they had experienced workplace sexual harassment. Um, there was from memory excuse me, a fairly similar estimate of the incidence of workplace bullying in um, an earlier report of the Productivity Commission. Uh, and both types of issues are, are associated with very low levels of reporting of such incidents. Um, and of course, there's some commonality in the personal, but also the economic costs um, uh, of bullying. So some observations about the anti-bullying jurisdiction that might be of interest. Um, the jurisdiction has been in place for, for almost five years. And whilst there were concerns uh, initially about a potential floodgate of claims, we have consistently had around seven to 800 applications made a year. And that relatively small volume has enabled us to apply a pretty a reasonably intensive case management approach to claims. Um, and I think that's particularly uh, important and valuable as these cases um, involve a continuing employment relationship. So taking care to preserve uh, the relationships is, is obviously important. So a really simple example, um, the applications are served by the Commission on the respondent party or parties only after they've received a telephone call from a member of staff. So rather than simply being served a legal document that can be both a shock and uh, intimidating, a conversation with a pretty nice human being um, explaining to them that a claim's been made, uh, that no judgments have been formed, uh, and explaining both the role of the Commission and the process ahead can go some way to alleviate some of the anxiety that, that can otherwise occur. And this is also important as we've, we find relatively low levels of representation in these cases. So this early and direct engagement with the parties and providing high levels of information is, I think, one of the strengths of uh, the approach and may go some way to explain the generally, generally uh, positive evaluations of the Commission's anti-bullying jurisdiction. The applications are also required under the legislation to be dealt with very quickly. We need to start dealing with them 
uh, within 14 days, which is also important. Um, our experience to date is that there are relatively high settlement and withdrawal rates and only a limited number of formal decisions or orders made by members of the tribunal. Um, the types of orders that have been made include things like requiring uh, the individual or the group to stop certain behaviours, regular monitoring of behaviours by an employer, um, orders that provide for information support and training to workers, uh, reviews of employer policies and orders of compliance with an employer's existing policy. There's, there's many possible explanations for the small number of orders that have been made, um, which don't necessarily indicate the effectiveness of the jurisdiction. So for example, um, sometimes serious matters are often dealt with by employers directly upon receipt of an application and often before any proceedings are held. There's similarly a high proportion of early dropouts um, where applications are not pursued or are withdrawn. And again, there's many reasons that this happens, um, including that the applicant has left the workplace and doesn't intend to return. And um, that means that in that jurisdiction, no order uh, would be able to be made or the applicants not comfortable with their application being served on their employer uh, or others. And that often comes from a misunderstanding of the Commission's powers, that this isn't a process where you make a complaint that someone uh, investigates on your behalf and takes up and pursues. Um, but also uh, applications are withdrawn because applicants are satisfied with the response the employers made following the application. So um, look, I might I might leave it there, um, um, Kate, and look forward to the discussion and any questions that uh, may come up. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And we do have a lot of questions coming through, so that's really good. And questions that will be a great basis for discussion. So that's great. Um, Turning to the first one, and it sort of um, we're going to do for for participants. We're gonna I'm gonna partly curate the questions, or make sure we get to the questions um, and answer some myself, and pass some to Bernadette. So if I start with the first question on how uh, the current COVID nineteen environment has impacted, in particular, this piece of work. And if, if I talk to that and then Bernadette, I'll pass to you to just talk generally about how COVID-19 has affected the Commission. Um, but if we go straight to respect at work, uh, as I said in my remarks, uh, it was tabled on the 5th of March and it was launched with uh, the Minister for Women, the Honourable Maurice Payne on the 6th. Uh, that was in fact the last sitting day uh, before uh, Parliament closed and then we found ourselves in the current situation that we're in. So it is, I'm very grateful that um, in the big workload that the Attorney General's Department has, uh, that they were able to um, get to the report in time to table it. Uh, because on reflection, I wonder whether it would have been tabled, it might have been delayed a, a, much longer if it hadn't got in there at that point in time. But obviously how we are sharing the outcomes has immediately changed and you're all participating on the new version of sharing um, of the outcomes, uh, which I personally have become quite convinced is actually a great way of sharing uh, a piece of work like this. In terms of the government response, and I think there is um, a question from Danny Philippa at Legal Aid ACT. Has the government given any firm indications whether they will implement any of the recommendations from the report? Well, the practical reality is, even though I think it is beautiful, it is a substantial report just to show it is um, over 900 pages, although participants I'm sure will know there is a beautiful community guide that uh, has a great executive summary. And so uh, definitely the Attorney General's Department is has the report, is reviewing it, but I anticipate that the government response will be now delayed as we all know they're addressing very important things. And so that 
That means I think a delay on any legislative change or funding commitments. Um, and there is, because they haven't had the opportunity to review, I wouldn't make any comment about what their response might be. Um, but I would reiterate what I said, which is uh, that the Attorney General and the Minister for Women have consistently supported their view of eliminating sexual harassment um, and it, it being something that Australia should lead the world on. So um, that has happened. So what, what in a COVID environment, what we know is obviously the types of sexual harassment that involve physical touching, of which uh, that was a high rate, the fit, touching, kissing, fondling, uh, that will, for many people, that has immediately stopped as people worked from moved to working from home. Um, but we know online harassment has increased. We know the eSafety Commission is looking at image-based abuse and cyberbullying and has seen a trend of increase. So we know the issue of sexual harassment at work has not gone away. Um, but as I said, the report includes um, absolutely, I think, a lot of the map forward that doesn't require government involvement, legislative change. So from our point of view, there is an opportunity in these webinars really push that forward. Um, my, I won't go into it too much, but my work has also um, moved to considering the gendered impacts of COVID and with a particular focus on the impacts of women and work and that, uh, that their, the nature of their work, the industries they're in and the type of work they have has resulted in them being more affected. So I'm focusing on that. But Bernadette, I know every time I take, talk to you, I'm so curious to know, uh, obviously workplaces and industrial relations have uh, immediately come to the forefront of our concerns about how we both go quickly responded to the health crisis, but then how we re-engage in the workplace. So I'm interested in what you can tell us about what's been happening in the Fair Work Commission. Well, there hasn't been much thumb twiddling. I can tell you that much. Um, so there's a, a well, there, there's any number of things. We have, we literally overnight essentially transformed into a remote organisation, uh, which was unprecedented and well, kind of remarkably in, in some respects worked pretty well. We've managed to continue to deliver all of our functions throughout this. And that's happened at a time where We've had particular um, urgent applications, both from parties, but also um, on the Commission's own motion to amend modern awards, vary enterprise agreements, to provide some flexibility to workplaces to deal with kind of um, issues coming out of COVID. Um, and well, a, a, as we've seen, even in the reports in the last kind of 24 hours, uh, there is a wave of um, cooperation and engagement by all the industrial parties that uh, is quite remarkable. Um, at the same time, we have overall seen a pretty significant net increase in our caseload across the board. It's up around, last I saw, about 40%. So that has kind of really stretched our, um, our staff and members frankly. Um, unsurprisingly, we've seen reductions in some areas, but in unfair dismissals and general protections in particular, we've seen some really kind of significant increases in volume there. Um, and the other uh, dimension that's kind of come into the mix in the last three or four weeks is uh, we were given a new jurisdiction to deal with certain JobKeeper disputes. So that was another piece of work that we sort of literally operationalised overnight and are now dealing with um, with those disputes and uh, working with the tax office and other agencies to try to provide some clear, consistent information and assistance to everyone that is grappling with, um, with that scheme. So yes, fun and games. There's never been a better time to be an IR. <laughs> you, uh, I must say, not twiddling your thumbs, I've got some after this webinar, my favourite quotes are, I'm not sure the world needs another set of fact sheets. Um, and then I've learnt the le language of one shotters versus frequent users. So it's it's great to know that you, you're you busy. Um, related to that question, and I, I suspect you and I won't have the answer to this, but it's a great question to ask. 
Um, but Bernadette, following the announcement by Morrison yesterday that there will be a review of the IR system, do you think there is an opportunity in any of the working groups to seek some of the changes proposed by the Respect at Work report? Do you have, I know these are all off the top of our heads, but uh, and that is fresh, fresh news that Monica Rhodes is asking about. Do you have any um, views on that? Look, um, not not a lot. I, I mean, I think that um, the whole issue of casual employment is and flexibility in um, awards and agreements are obviously going to be very strong um, uh, aspects of the conversations. Um, I guess I just. Uh, you know, like all of these things where there can be consensus and agreement uh, and common ground found, that's always a much stronger foundation than uh, adversarial and um, uh, other processes. So I just wish uh, all involved the very best of luck in coming up with some um, areas of agreement. Yes, and I, I notice you're absolutely right that the five areas of focus don't specifically rate to sec relate to sexual harassment, but they do cover awards and enterprise bargaining and casuals. So re related to that, I guess my answer is, um, I think everything is being looked at new. So uh, in answer to that question, it's not clear, um, but uh, I think there is an opportunity to rethink everything, and I do think we have a very, we have smart people in government who will be thinking of everything. Um, there is another question which goes to your um, comment, Bernadette, and I'll sort of start. I'll ask the question and start an answer, and I'm interested in your view. Uh, but from Leah Marin at Australian Women Lawyers. With the current economic situation, people will be likely more fearful of making complaints as fear of being labelled a troublemaker and risk losing their jobs. What will both of your organisations do in the short term to help people feel safe in making complaints? So if I have the first go at that, I think um, more importantly, that question for me um, gets to one of the things that we found was relevant in why sexual harassment has uh, perhaps not had the downward trajectory that we all assumed, uh, that there are a number of things have changed, but the increase in the gig economy, you know, the numbers of casual and part-time and temporary fixed-term workers meant that, um, you know, putting aside the nature of the work, if you are not in a job that you think you'll be for the rest of your life, you are inevitably feeling less secure and confident. And there's some industries that really that is the nature of their employment. So the media and entertainment sector is a sector that does a season of a show or, you know, the makeup artists are as they come along. So I think that question, I think this will be why those areas of focus include casual, is that there is no question that some of the reason that there is uh, challenges in bringing complaints is because of people just being concerned about the income. We heard that consistently across the 18 months. But our solution wasn't necessarily that more people should use the legal mechanisms. It was that employers should create more options for individuals at the workplace. Now, in terms of the mechanisms, that was absolutely one of the reasons why we were interested in the stop sexual harassment idea of an option that's not quite as comprehensive or uh, sort of seemingly intimidating or uh, long term that just we want a solution that's much more nimble to the problem. Um, so in practice, I think that the current situation does continue a trend that we've noticed that people are um, perhaps uh, concerned about their ongoing employment, but also not actually, most people don't really want to complain, even though I think your agency and ours provides, you know, in normal times, pretty good mechanisms. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? And also I might fold in while I go across to you. Uh, there, oh, I know, I think it was, it was a question about the SOP sexual harassment order, although I do believe you've sort of covered that in your remarks because this question came in before you'd finished your remarks, but just about 
whether you um, envis envisage such a thing might, which is obviously not passed yet, so it's not happening, but whether it would operate the same or whether there would be mutual lessons that you could learn in the stop bullying jurisdiction. So if you could, just any reflections on the casual nature of employment and how a stop sexual harassment order might work, but recognising you've made some comments already. Sure. Uh, so it, it, in terms of the first question, um, what, what are we doing uh, in light of the fact that people may be more reluctant to make complaints? Um, look, it's, it's a broad question and, a, and it's an ongoing everyday challenge that uh, we all try to address. Um, and our for the way we approach it is really to constantly try to refine and review our processes and mechanisms and information and support to demystify it, to make it as accessible as possible, um, to provide ways that people can easily in, in simple terms get the information and assistance that they need and understand that cool. um, uh, get the assistance that they need um, and that they don't necessarily need to be legally or otherwise represented. So it's about a constant challenge of being as an accessible a tribunal uh, as we can be. And the other aspect to that is we have a pretty extensive um, workplace advice service where we can provide uh, some initial legal advice to applicants and indeed respondent employers. Um, again, just to demystify, make clear the road ahead and provide that uh, that level of assistance. So it's not a new challenge. It's a never ending one. Um, there's always more to be done. Uh, but I agree, you know, that there is, um, well, certainly work that we've done, you can see there is a correlation and it makes sense that when there is high levels of unemployment and uncertainty, um, people are more likely uh, to be concerned. Um, in terms of the second question, uh, look, it's it's one that's actually very impossible to answer because our, our mandate is to operationalise the whatever jurisdiction or legislation is in place. Um, there's no doubt that uh, so we'd obviously have to see if government adopts this recommendation and if so, in what form. Um, in that process, uh, I think, um, you know, we would routinely have a think about uh, what lessons we might learn and offer up in terms of how we could um, uh, do things differently. Um, yeah. 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 Um, can I uh, sort of do a reflection and then ask about how this works at the Fair Work Commission? So one of the things that really probably struck me the most, a lot that I heard in the inquiry I, was what I expected, but that's because I've worked in this area a long time and I think you wouldn't have been su surprised. But one of the things that I was most shocked by was the long-term harm of sexual harassment, but actually just as much of the process that follows the sexual harassment. So I, I spoke to people and, you know, 20 years later, it was like it had just happened, but there was something about the institutional betrayal and then the legal process and that. Um, so uh, it really struck me that whilst probably a lot of participants on this call do prioritise procedural fairness and, you know, the uh, taking the time, that timeframes were such a big contributor as well as process. So I'm thinking of uh, one particular woman and she was only two years after the event, but as the, as, as the internal process, she made a complaint and they worked out she was a contractor. So then they sent it off to the contractor. They had a go at it and then they the contract finished. So then she was on workers' comp. Um, she didn't end up using uh, any of the processes, but she said she was have so much of her time was spent figuring out the forms to fill out the medical appointments for the workers' compensation, as well as working out how to do the file, the forms in. And then I've heard a number of people I recently spoke to, Carolyn Tan, who in 2008 was one, uh, her sexual harassment 
case involving uh, her role as a neurosurgeon. Uh, but talking to her, you realise that was 2008, so it's 12 years ago. She's never been able to get her career back on track, uh, but the process itself and then the media reporting was really difficult. So the question for you and for me, but really in our report, we did really focus on that is, if you take a victim-centric approach, which sometimes feels like it doesn't match the legal procedural requirements, and you either speed things up or you don't follow the full blown, you know, kind of mechanism sometimes, maybe that sometimes leads to a better outcome. But there seems to be a conflict between the two. And I know for our um, commission, we have started an early set down process. And I know we've uh, talked, I don't know whether it came from you or you've talked to us, but I know we've all talked about this. Uh, so I'm interested in your thoughts on time frames. I know the stop bullying, you know, you're really trying to recognise that no matter how good the process, if it's 12 months of agony, then that's not a good process. So how do you look at timeframes in these sorts of cases? Uh, look, I, I agree that um, timely resolution of claims is absolutely kind of key to enabling people to move on uh, with their business or their life or uh, whatever perspective they bring to it. Um, the, the answer at the Fair Work Commission is, is pretty straightforward. Um, from the president down, he is absolutely kind of committed to really uh, tight timeframes um, on all cases. So I mentioned the anti-bullying, which is mandated in the legislation. Um, but for example, and look, fundamentally, it's um, partly a product of um, resources, partly a product of expectations and clarity and um, and management. Uh, and so we approach it in, with all of those dimensions. But for example, the new JobKeeper jurisdiction um, uh, that we've just taken on, the benchmarks that the president has set for those is that 90% are finalised within four days. Um, and 100% within 14 days. So there's a lot that can be done and um, we are constantly trying to chip away and uh, improve our performance. At the same time, the one thing that will never change and shouldn't uh, is the fundamental obligation to afford procedural fairness uh, mm -hmm. to, to all parties. Um, but bringing people in early, and certainly our experience with most of these areas is um, the earlier that you can bring the parties together in whatever form or mechanism is appropriate, the more likely it is that they're going to be able to find a way to resolve the matter themselves. Um, and that's, I think, the, the better outcome generally. Mm. I think the, that that will be our experience as well before everyone's entrenched their positions and um, really, and, and things have moved on. Um, Re sort of related to that, and it's only related in my head, it's not in the question, but there is a question. What are your observations about the role of external workplace investigators as fact finders and whether or not this is an effective and appropriate response for an employer to a complaint of sexual harassment? So if I have a go and then pass that to you, the reason I'm saying that's connected is how employers respond to the complaint when it comes to them because I think there are two gateways and our organisations are both at the disadvantage. Whenever I talk to our um, complaint staff, I say this takes such a long time and they're like, you know, sometimes it's a long time since the event occurred and sometimes that length of time is because the person was waiting for the internal process to come to an end. And so I know through the conciliations I did a round table of HR and IR people who pretty much said, if we get a case, it's six weeks every time. You know, if someone comes in and says a sexual harassment occurred, it's, you know, that's generally the formula. And if you've just been harassed and you have to wait six weeks, I, I just heard over and over again, that's just, that's hard work. Um, but so the role of external workplace investigators, we really had this conversation a lot. What we were really interested in, in how complaints were handled, and it, it probably reflects in our training recommendation across the board, is that if the people had the right expertise, 
um, and they could act quickly, but they also had, you know, knowledge of the drivers and trauma, uh, they could do a good job. And generally speaking, organisations didn't have that in-house, so they could access that externally. Uh, so one thing is the, the nature and the training and the education. And in that part of the workplace chapter, we talk about the people dealing with these, whether they be internal and external, having better expertise. But at the same time, half of our population is employed in small business, and there is no way that those organisations can access external investigators anyway. So we came up with a view that there is a role, but I think my end point was that we want people to be thinking, putting more effort into prevention because response is really, you know, very difficult after it's happened. So it's not that you shouldn't do it, but the high level of focus of no action, but then a very strong sort of legal response to fact finding. And it, it wasn't, none of these things were ending well. So even though I think there is a role, I think I would still say employers um, read the part of the report about more proactive prevention. What you would see the outcome, you would get cases, whether it's sexual harassment or others, where the investigation was done internally or externally. What are your reflections on that process? Oh, look, to be honest, Kate, um, uh, I'm probably not close enough to, the, to talk in detail about that, other than to say, as a general principle, prevention is almost invariably uh, better than cure. And this is only an impression from um, looking at various decisions of members of the commission. Um, there seems to be great variability in the quality, effectiveness, and therefore use of uh, external investigators. Um, it's a very mixed bag from what I can, can see. So for that, the person who asked that question, who I'm sure I've got there, um, uh, I would say we we did in the workplace section, we did look at specific targeted education for HR people, given that they're often the ones that receive these. And we did consider, and it's going to show, I don't think we ended up with a specific uh, training program because it's an, it, it's an interesting field investigations as to how it's regulated or not regulated and whether there's qualifications or not. Uh, but we absolutely do believe there should be specialist education. Um, I'll go to, uh, we've just got time for uh, one or two more questions. So I will go to one which, um, which goes to, I think, what both of us are doing. Um, the question is, is there an intention to offer a full training package or suite? If adopted, employ employers often spend time and attention on developing internally. However, it's not efficient, particularly for not-for-profits. Uh, there is, there, a, there is a, a set benchmark, and if the package is offered, I think this would be incredibly helpful, particularly for SMEs. So to the anonymous person who sent that in, I couldn't agree with you more with that question. Um, we, uh, When you look at the recommendations, uh, there is a recommendation for a platform called Respect at Work. So it's um, using the idea, so if I describe it, really supported by the Workplace Sexual Harassment Council, which is all the different agencies, um, to deliver just some good practice, just echoing um, Bernadette's comment, we don't need more fact sheets. No one needs to design from scratch a new sexual harassment training program. One of the things that um, really affected me a lot was learning about what policies were in place and what training and how big organisations all designed their nice, new, shiny training. And what media and entertainment quickly realised is people move around the industry. They just, uh, they came up with a one code of conduct so you didn't have to learn the new policy every time you got to a new location. And they started looking at one training program because in an industry, so we make some specific recommendations that I think in an industry, the kind of risky moments and the scenarios and the how sexual harassment works, that training can be delivered 
very much across an industry in a similar manner. And there is, I agree, there's a lot of wasted effort. This is not a competitive advantage. We're all trying to get there in big business and then there's just no resources in small. So the recommendation, um, which, uh, which is actually where we got the name of the report, but of a an online portal to really bring together all those bits and pieces. So Bernadette, when you talked about that, that's the idea is we've all got good practice. Can we bring that together? Can we make it deliverable and easy to access? Uh, I know that that's constantly something we're separately thinking about, safe workers thinking about, you're thinking about. So the concept is that there would be one place that would provide everyone equal access and would also make it easier for workers to not have to sort of work out what's the new platform and the new message. Do you have any thoughts about that um, helping small business and also not for profits? Oh, look, I just endorse the comments and approach that you've, you know, the response that you've given. Um, and that, that's also, I think, one of the opportunities with the proposed council um, to provide a bit of that coordination and high level guidance about those resources. So I think the need is, is very clear. Um, it's finding the best ways to deliver it. And I think the other recommendation um, for employers and employer reps and trade unions to collaborate around some of that material, they, they in many respects are best placed to know what good looks like um, and to make it effective and practical. So for those people who want to look up their recommendation, 47 on industry-wide initiatives and 48 on the platform that could share um, the resources, uh, that is a good example of something that we're working out how we can get that up and running without getting the opportunity to get funding or to make it work. We're just working out. So if anyone wants to help us, let us know. Uh, I'll, I'll just raise one one more question and then I'll close because uh, we're getting close to the end. So the last question is really um, from Louise Wine, the National Director at the National Association of Women in Operations. Uh, what role can associations such as mine play in helping to educate employers on best practice recommendations? What can or should we be doing to help? Bernadette, do you have any thoughts on organisations like that? Look, I, I think um, uh, we've covered it. Uh, the answer is plenty um, uh, and go for it and, and just start doing it. And if agencies like ourselves and I'm sure yours, Kate and others um, are always willing to you know, offer some kind of assistance where we can uh, to help you do that work, go forth and do. <laughs> uh, and and I will uh, I will um, confirm the same and say I guess when I look at organisations like that, consistent with what Bernadette just said, uh, I believe that the way we're getting real traction, we've seen it in universities, we've seen it in media, is by industries coming together, so that uh, the associations like yours could start, you know, try and prompt other players, unions, employers, key um, employer associations to come together to start a conversation on how your particular industry or area might start moving forward. That would be my really concrete, um, you know, I'm sure that you have been raising and encouraging people to stop sexual harassment for a long time. Uh, but sharing the report and finding a way to say well, we've got a crystallised moment to discuss it would be a great thing. So Bernadette, you might be pleased to know there was no question about fair work, unfair dismissal uh, decisions about sexual harassment. Uh, you and I have been talking about that and what we can do to make sure um, that the kind of the wisdom through the inquiry is shared with the Fair Work Commission and I'm looking forward to working with you on that. Uh, as I said, we heard through the inquiry about that question about, you know, whether there were mixed signals, um, but we know that we've got something really good to go forward with and, um, and I look forward to that um, being something we do together. So I think it is coming close to the end of our time, so I'll um, 
bring this to a close, particularly let me start, Bernadette, by thanking you uh, for joining us today. It's been a real privilege that we could have you um, for this session, but also actually it's been a real privilege uh, that we've been able to work with you. I'm really, and, and with your uh, president and commission members who've assisted us through this inquiry. Thank you also to today's participants. Uh, I hope that you will join us in promoting and implementing respect at work. I know from the questions it indicates that you will. Uh, we'll share information about the recording of this event on social media and I encourage you to reshare this content. Uh, so we will keep the recording on our website. Uh, please check out our website and social media for upcoming webinars and encourage others to attend. You, you will have realized we're targeting them at different audiences and we're having different guest speakers. So whilst uh, some of my opening remarks might be similar each time we're focusing on a different part of the report. In one way, respect at work reflects that sexual harassment is a complex issue and our recommendations are numerous and wide ranging, but the core of what we're talking about couldn't be simpler. Workplace sexual harassment is not inevitable, it's not acceptable and it is preventable. So I appreciate you taking the time to participate today. I appreciate Bernadette giving us her time in a very busy time for her. And I encourage you to consider how you can help make Australian workplaces safe, safer through eliminating sexual harassment. Thank you.